Okay, today we are in the Gospel of John, chapter 5. Last time we studied verses 17 through 30, so let's pick it up at um, verse 30 today for a little bit of context, and we're going to read through the end of the chapter. And today, Jesus is teaching those who had been present at the healing of a lame man. And it was kind of strange, but that healing and the, you know, the following things... Um, resulted in some hatred and some criticism from some of those that were only focused on their religious rules. They seemed not to care about the power of God working right in front of them that they'd never seen before. But now Jesus has taken it one step further. He let them know that it's, he's not just another man, but they're actually disrespecting with their self-righteousness God himself. And he backs that up today with four witnesses. So he challenges the listeners as he confirms who he is and the life that he wants to bring to everyone that will believe. So I'm going to be reading from the New King James Translation so you can follow along. The Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 30. I can of myself do nothing. This is Jesus talking. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own, but the will of the Father who sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You have sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than John's, for the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Verse 37. And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form. But you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent, him you do not believe. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive honor from men, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There's one who accuses you. Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. In verse 47 at the end of chapter 5, but if you do not believe his words and writings, how will you believe my words? So that was John chapter 5, the ending of it. And in the words of Jesus that we've studied in the last few chapters, and many chapters as we go forward, uh, Jesus claims a lot makes a lot of claims and people who have only heard a little about Jesus may think he was crazy or a lunatic, maybe a liar. Um, those who read more in digging in Jesus' claims may claim that he was a great teacher. Have you ever heard that? Oh, I believe Jesus was a great teacher. It, it might sound respectful at first, but um, a dear brother in the Lord and intellectual giant of the 20th century, C.S. Lewis, said of that, I am trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, that I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. C.S. Lewis says, that is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He'd be either a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell trying to deceive people. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, and he did not intend to. So C.S. Lewis came to the conclusion that I believe an honest, intellectual person and just a normal human being must arrive at after studying the evidence. He says, 
Now it seems obvious to me that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend, and consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. God has landed on this enemy-occupied world in human form. So that was uh, a lot of wisdom that C.S. Lewis had in, in uh, these fireside chats he had. This was actually right after World War II, and he had, uh, or during World War II, and he had these, these chats that he had on the radio, and that was taken from one of those. But brothers and sisters, everyone who hears the words, the works, and the testimonies of Jesus must come to a conclusion for themselves. After telling the crowd about some incredible things that were going to be happening in the future, Jesus says in verse 30, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. You know, if you were with us last week, you know he said something very similar just a few verses earlier. And he doesn't repeat himself a lot when he's talking to a group of people. But it's very important. You know, take notes when he does, because this one he's summarizing the fact that he's taking orders from and obeying the will of the Father, God. This is where his power comes from. This is what qualifies him to be a righteous judge over giving and withholding life, both in the flesh temporarily and also in the spirit eternally. He knows that the people he's talking to are still not understanding what he's saying. And, and later, a few chapters later in John 8, 28, Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, and he's speaking of being crucified, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as the Father taught me, I speak these things. So he's saying they're not going to really understand it until after he fulfills the, his mission by laying down his life for their sins, for their true sins, which is displeasing God, not obeying God, and not, you know, the, the, not the things he, they were accusing him of, the petty things that religious leaders are accusing him about doing. Um, they want to kill Jesus for some petty things that they came up with. But that won't happen until Jesus voluntarily, at his appointed hour, is nailed to a cross for their sins and for yours and for mine. So our life lesson here is that true power and authority only come to those who lay down their lives to fully obey the will of Father God. True power and authority come only to those who lay down their lives to fully obey the will of the Father God. Now the power and authority that Jesus claimed, uh, was, and, and in fact demonstrated uh, throughout his life and, and through his, throughout his ministry, was well beyond that of the religious and political leaders who were challenging him. Of course, he knew that. At the same time, We've seen Jesus continually reach out to each person at the level that they are on in their own stage of life experience. To, to me, this is just a wonderful way to help us understand how to share. And we talked about that earlier, brother, uh, how to share the gospel, how to share Jesus with people is, is pulling something together uh, from someone's life experience. In the last teaching, Jesus would claim some incredible authority and told people that they would even see the power of God working through him and his father in ways they'd never seen before. He knew that his testimony, so to speak, when he told them this about the power and authority was making the religious leaders uncomfortable at the least, <laughs> if you want to say uncomfortable. But I think he wanted to give them every chance to be able to understand and even to truly believe in him as the son of God. So just as we've seen him do with other people that ended up following him, Jesus is building a bridge even to the religious leaders who've already indicated they wanted to kill him he wanted to give them every possible chance to connect the dots and believe in 2nd Peter 3 9 the Bible says the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness but is long-suffering toward us not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance does that include your enemies I'm not sure about you, but uh, although I try to be understanding and long-suffering, patient towards those that are antagonistic, at some point, I think I would just want to zap them out of existence, you know? <laughs> Jesus had this power. 
and the point at which they're actively plotting to kill me would probably be the place where I would draw the line. But Jesus didn't do that. He did not stop giving these men a chance, even as they sought to kill him. So that gives us another challenging life lesson today. And so our next life lesson is give others every opportunity to come to the truth, even when they are hateful and actively opposing the truth. It's not an easy one, but it's a lesson we should internalize. Give others every opportunity to come to the truth, even when they are hateful and actively opposing the truth. Now, let me go back to that bridge again that uh, we were talking about. Jesus knew that those, what those who oppose him were thinking and maybe even talking among themselves that day. And, um, you know, their thoughts were that he was making claims that were just words from his own mouth. That was their plan. He used to say, oh, he just, you know, he's, he's just one person and we can't accept that. We, you can't, nobody can verify that. Um, in fact, they were counting on using, ironically, his own words against him because he is the word of God. In Deuteronomy 19.50, the word of God says and commands that uh, one witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or sin that he commits. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. So that was a law concerning a witness, basically in a court case, but this law was also applied quite widely, not only to apply to courts, uh, but also to really any disputable fact or, or claim. And later on, we see the Pharisees even speak up themselves. In, in John 18, 3, it says, The Pharisees therefore said to, them, said to him, You bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Okay, so they're, they're saying this. Now, long before they said that to him, he teaches what we're hearing today. So we see Jesus basically preemptively making a solid case for himself even before they brought it up against him. Verse 31 says, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Okay? Now, <laughs> this is one of, those, one of those where I'm like, okay, so Jesus, you're saying that you're not telling the truth <laughs> because we know that you just bore witness of yourself a few moments ago. So I kind of dug in there and I found out he's, he's not lying to them. He's actually referring to that command that we just read in Deuteronomy, that we read earlier, that there must be at least two witnesses to establish the witness is a true witness or a valid witness. Uh, I, I like, you know, I like the Amplified translation. And it says in that verse, if I alone testify in my behalf, my testimony is not valid and cannot be worth anything. So I, I think that more, uh, more uh, concisely says what Jesus is saying here. Because of this law, because of this rule, uh, I can't testify just of myself. So if I do it just by myself, it doesn't really mean anything. So he goes on in verse 32 to say, there is another who bears witness of me. And I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. So Jesus, again, is making it very clear it's not just him that's making the claims of divinity. I tell you what, God is so patient with us. You see the picture? God himself is standing in front of people, and some of them are so self-absorbed in their own rules and their own agenda, they refuse to recognize him. How many times have you heard someone say, well, if God came and stood in front of me, then I'd believe in him. No, they wouldn't. <laughs> we, we see that. We have a record of that happening. But he proceeds to to humble himself so much and he starts to use their own logic and proofs, even though they're on the level of man, not on the level of God. But he, he comes down to our level so that we can have some of that understanding. He loves us so much, he came to this world where you know, the most luxurious place, most luxurious palace in, in the entire world uh, compared to where he's at, you know, where he lives in heaven is like a garbage can. <laughs> you know? And yet, he humbly brings himself down to our thinking and our way. In this way, we, we see this and we, we don't miss the validity of the claims that he's making. And we can know for sure that he is true. It's simple beyond my imagination. I, I can't imagine him, you know, someone doing that or me doing that. But let's look at the witnesses that Jesus mentions. The first is the testimony of John the Baptist. The baptizer, as I like to say. Verse 33 says, you have sent John, excuse me, you have sent to John 
and he's borne witness to the truth. Yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. So John's testimony was a, a solemn testimony. It was a public testimony. Many of the religious leaders, including some of those standing there accusing Jesus, actually did believe in John's testimony. Even when his words were not popular with them, they knew he was right. They respected John. They even sent delegations to him to find out more information from him. His testimony was true, and they knew it. And you notice that Jesus didn't say, he bore witness to me. Jesus said, he bore witness to the truth. And as they say, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. John was such a holy and honest man. They, he was so against corruption. Uh, that's one of the things they didn't like, but he was against the corruption in the world and, and in the religious system. He was familiar with the scriptures and the things of God. Nobody could ever have imagined that John would have given a false testimony of any kind. He was just that kind of man. So as we see him giving that testimony, if, if he wasn't 110% sure that, that Jesus was the Messiah, he would not have stood out publicly and, and said, Jesus is the Messiah. Okay, so in, uh, in presenting John, Jesus paints, uh, I think, just a beautiful word picture about John. He says him, of him here, he was the burning and shining lamp. And you were, willing to, you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. Doesn't say, Jesus doesn't say that John was the light. No, Jesus was the light. He said he was a lamp. So what does a lamp do? Well, it doesn't light itself, if you've ever had a lamp. It doesn't run on its own power, uh, so to speak. It, it borrows light. You have to light it. It has to uh, be lit. And then it gives off light that does not originate from itself. It originates somewhere else. Jesus said that John was a shining lamp. He shone on to guide and point men. To who? To repentance and to Jesus. Jesus also says John was the burning lamp, not giving uh, the cold message of legalism or intellect as the people were used to, but rather burning with a passion to reach people, to prepare the way of the Lord. That's what John the baptizer did making their paths straight, getting their lives pointing back to truly loving and serving God. It was a passion. It was a burning passion. It also gives us the picture of a burning lamp of, of a consuming fire. You know, a lamp does not go on forever. What happens? Back in that day, especially, an oil lamp would burn and burn and burn while giving off light and warming and heating, but it was being consumed. And John was right on target that day when his disciples came to him. He was, they were concerned about Jesus' ministry. And they came to him and said, uh, you know, hey, what about this man over here? He's baptizing more than you are. You know, he's, he's getting more converts. And John said, therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He wasn't mad. He was glad. And he said, he must increase and I must decrease. Just as a lamp eventually consumes all the oil within and burns out, John was a true witness that burned himself out to show others the light of Jesus Christ. And he did it. As he did it, John's joy became greater and greater. You know, I've seen people like that. Um, that as they, they burn themselves out, so to speak, and, and point people to Jesus, they just get more joyful and joyful. My dad is one of those people like that. And dad, if you're watching, hi. Yes, you. We see that in you. Our Lord pointed out to the Jewish leaders who challenged him that even they were, for a time, rejoicing in John's light, the light that John gave off. So our life lesson here is allow yourself to become a burning and shining lamp as a witness for Jesus. Allow yourself to become a burning and shining lamp as a witness for Jesus. Now John talks about three more witnesses in addition to John the baptizer. Uh, and I'd like to make the point here Jesus absolutely did not need to make a defense for himself here. Uh, he did not need to bring in the testimony of John or other, other witnesses, but he has given these other witnesses a spotlight so that anybody who has any doubts but is willing to give a fair he hearing to the evidence that they may be saved. 
So yes, his enemies and opposition were included. And the second witness is not a person, but it's the works of Jesus. In verse 36, but I have a greater witness than John's for the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Again, the, the controversy that started this, in this story is the, a miraculous healing of a man who had been lame for 38 years. And Jesus is pointing out that this very act and many more marvelous works are the second witness that's confirming his claims. He healed and freed that lame man from being enslaved to his own body's weaknesses, virtually chained to the pool of Bethesda, um, you know, and, and confined to the bed that he laid on. And he was in the middle of a crowd that for 38 years refused to help him to get a healing. You've seen that Jesus' miraculous works were simple acts of love, compassion, and mercy. They're done for people that needed them. Sometimes people didn't even know they needed them, like the, the miracle of the wedding of Cana. I don't even know if the bridegroom knew <laughs> that they'd run out of wine. But Jesus basically saved the day, did something that was really would have been embarrassing for that man. So these, these works and their motivation bear witness to the heart of God. And it comes right down to who, who God is. He's not a, you know, some people say, oh, the God of the Old Testament was mean. No, he wasn't. Love, you know, there, there's one of the Psalms talks about his loving kindness, every verse. And we, we see that over and over. Uh, but the Jews were looking for a miraculous Messiah that would miraculously, you know, go and defeat military and political enemies and bring deliverance to Israel. They weren't looking for a God that would, a Messiah that would show his power in simple acts of compassion and love and mercy. But because Jesus' miracles didn't fit in with what they thought the Messiah would be doing, they just refused to accept that Jesus' wonderful works were part of that. It was sad, but his works were a second witness. Thirdly, we see Jesus points to the testimony of the Father. Verse 37, and the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form, but you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent him you do not believe. Now, we've studied specifically that the Father testified of the Son in many Old Testament prophecies. And most recently, we saw him, the Father testify by voice at the baptism of Jesus. Now, the Apostle John doesn't record this because, honestly, everybody that John was writing to already knew what happened at Jesus' baptism. Uh, but fortunately, we do have that, that record preserved in the other three synoptic Gospels. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it says, When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now the Jewish tradition at the time, uh, still today, would places a strong emphasis that a voice from heaven is truly a message from God. It may be, you know, if sometimes it was from an angelic being, sometimes it was from God if they did not see the angel. And we see that several times in the Hebrew scriptures. Now, this testimony about Jesus from the Father was one of the many things that really made the headlines if they had newspapers in Israel, but word got around. Um, and it's likely that even some of those people that were there listening to him at this time may have even seen, may have even witnessed the baptism of Jesus and, and heard the voice of God. So again, I'm thinking there's, an, there's a contradiction. Why does Jesus say the Father himself spoke, people saw God's spirit in the form of a dove, and then Jesus says the next verse, you've never seen his voice, you've never heard his voice, you've never seen his form. Well, Jesus loved to play on words, okay? And we, we, we find that happening throughout this John so far. And, um, you know, this, this may shock you. And you can ask Mitzi, she'll, she'll be a, a witness for me to tell you this is the truth. Sometimes when my children were young, there were times that we'd have to tell them things, give them instructions that they just didn't want to hear. 
And when we got done telling them, we follow up with, do you hear what I'm saying? And even though neither one of our, my kids ever failed a hearing test, they didn't respond. So we'd have to say it again, did you hear me? And even though they were just a few feet away from us, finally they would respond, yeah, I hear you. Or something, you know, bright and cheerful like that. Well, at that point, we know they had heard, but they didn't hear. They weren't listening. So the Amplified gives us a little more accurate nuances in, in the verses we read in verse 37 to 38. It says, not one of you has ever given ear to his voice or seen his form, his face, what he is like. You have always been deaf to his voice and blind to the vision of him. And you have not his word, his thought living in your hearts because you do not believe and adhere to and trust in and rely on him whom he has sent. That is why you do not keep his message living in you because you do not believe in the messenger whom he has sent. So that's the key for us to learn from today. They have a problem with the testimony of the Father because they do not allow the word to become alive in him. We may not hear Father God audibly or see him with our eyes, but we do have his word. These leaders were guilty because they did not abide in the word and the vision that God gave them in his word. Our life lesson on this is very simple. Trust in the words of God. See him with spiritual eyes. Trust in the word of God. See him with spiritual eyes. And that brings us to the fourth witness. Verse 39, the testimony of the scriptures. It says, you search the scriptures, for in them you think that you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. Now, you'll recall we talked about the scribes and the Pharisees, they were charged with studying and memorizing and thinking upon the scriptures continually so they could accurately teach and pro proclaim those. And they correctly thought, as Jesus says here, they correctly thought that eternal life was found in God's revelation and studying the scriptures. The Greek word that was used here for search implies not just, you know, a Google search that we do nowadays, but actually a thorough investigation, tracking down the true meaning of the scriptures is what, he was, what, what they were supposed to be doing. But while they read them, the scriptures, and looked at them with almost a superstitious reverence for the letter of the law, they never permeated into him. They never penetrated into them to really find the great truths that they were pointing out to the people. They weren't reading it to search for God but instead, they were reading it to find arguments to support their positions. I know you've never found anybody like that before. <laughs> you've never heard a sermon based around one part of one verse from anybody that they disregarded the rest of the scriptures and just grabbed onto one and, and ran with it. But anyway, uh, I, I won't go there. But see, that's a great tragedy uh, for that people today and for those people for all their painstaking explorations of scriptures, they never found the clues that would lead them to what they really needed, and that was knowing God and having eternal life. They really did not love God. They really loved their own ideas about himself. So their study of the scriptures, uh, if it had been sincere, would have seen that they spoke of the Messiah, the Son of God, God the Son. Recognizing and believing in Jesus would be a measure of their true understanding of the scriptures. It wasn't happening. So our life lesson on this is no matter how much you love your own ideas about God, when you study the Bible, ask God to show you the true meaning he has for you to learn each day. It's a little longer. No matter how much you love your own ideas about God, when you study the Bible, ask God to show you the true meaning he has for you to learn each day. So let's remember these four witnesses, John the baptizer, the works that Jesus did, the Father's voice, and the scriptures, which included, of course, the books of Moses. And at a later date, we'll see that Jesus will remind this same group that his testimony is indeed true since these witnesses have already verified them. Now, finally, for those who still refuse to believe, Jesus plainly tells them in verse 40, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Verse 41, I do not receive honor from men. 
Now, these leaders, as we've seen, had all the testimony anyone could have ever wanted. But their concern was more that they wanted praise from and honor from men that were around them who they could see, rather than praise from God who they could not see. They searched the scriptures, which was good, but it's not seeing the answers and ignoring them that brings salvation to a person. It's that faith and belief that makes you find that find God and makes the difference. All the scriptures point to that faith, that trust in Jesus. But you have to be willing to accept and receive him to have eternal life. Jesus continues and paints a sad picture of those who have learned the scriptures well, but not follow God with their hearts. So in verse 42 and 43, he says, But I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. So Jesus here is even saying, he's prophesying of a day in the future, when the lack of a heart for God will leave people open to a terrible deception. And the Antichrists that are coming, the Jews will follow after them. And we see that happens several times in history, even past that. And we know in these last days that will happen in a greater, greater fashion. In verse 44, he continues, How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? You know, the fatal error of the religious leaders of Jesus' day and ever since is pride. They long for that prestige and honor from one another and were willing to sacrifice honor from, that come from God alone. They love the praises of men rather than the praises from God. They will not hear the words. When this life is over, well done, you good and faithful servant from our master. I trust that the following Lord will help us to hear those words. Finally, as, as Jesus explained to the people their real reason for unbelief, for good measure, he speaks to them really directly where the rubber meets the road. The leaders he was talking to, and there's other people around listening as well, but the leaders he was talking to that day were they made a huge deal of saying, I'm following Moses. We're following the law. You know, we are followers of Moses. Over and over again, they would say they were following Moses. So we see in verses 45 to 48, Jesus said, Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. Basically, do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. For there is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. If you believe Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? This, this was a powerful thing here. And honestly, I don't think Jesus would have said all of these things if it had not touched the hearts of some of the men that were listening, that thought about this, and then turned to follow Jesus. But many of them didn't. You know, Jesus was not calling these religious leaders to a a new faith or a different faith. He calls, called them to believe what they said they believed. He called them to believe Moses, what the scriptures say, what his works said, what the Father says, what John the Baptist testified about, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, God the Son. And if they refused to hear this overwhelming testimony, it was unlikely that he, they would believe his own words. So this has been just an interesting and, and a little bit different passage of scripture to, to try to dig into. But I think we, we, I think we see the picture now that Jesus was given them and us every opportunity to see the truth and to rely on the witnesses that are there and to, to show that. So the question for us is today, do you, do I truly rely on and cling to and fully trust in Jesus? I hope so. If not, I just want to encourage you to take a few minutes right now to renew or, or even start a relationship with God. There's no better time than right now. Just let God know that you're sorry for your sins. Let him know you're sorry for putting things ahead of him. Um, they call it idolatry, you know, putting something in place of God. Ask him to forgive you and give you the power through his Holy Spirit to live life his way, not your way, and to follow him each day. That's the beginning of the journey. And as we finish up, I'd like to pray a blessing over you from God's word. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. 
in the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Thanks for being with us today. Again, if there's anything you'd like uh, for us to pray with you about, let me or, or Mitzi know. And uh, if you're staying here, we'd love to see you next week. God bless you.